Yes, me and everybody. It's me and welcome to this week's CMI Testament Institute. I'm Matt Roberts, I'm the Director of Membership here at CMI, and this week I'm in Brian Franca, our CEO, who's taking some much to do on the week. This is not the only one of these things to see, and I hope you'll find today very inspirational, and I'm sure that at the end of the season, take a look at the links that's in the live chat, and that we'll enable you to hear a little bit more about what CMI is going to do. And for existing members, welcome along. Don't forget that you've got access to a huge number of details around the issues that you've got today, as well as many of the mentioned in the And again, there's a link to the live chat to show you what's taking place in the future. Delighted today to be joined by two chartered companions of CMI who are both in the midst of the tricky challenge of reopening their businesses following some of the restrictions that we faced around the COVID crisis. Mike Clasper, CBE, is chair of SSP Group and of Coates, and is also past president of CMI. Welcome along, Mike. Great to have you with us. And Catherine Austin Hi. is chief people and marketing officer at Pizza Hut, um, and again, is playing a huge role on a day-to-day -day basis in helping that organisation to get back up and running in this middle of times. Great to have you both with us today. A warm welcome, Mike and Catherine, and thanks for joining us. Just before we get into the questions, I'd just like to let everybody that's watching us live know that if you've got a question that you'd like to pose to Catherine or to Mike, uh, then please just drop that question into the live chat and the CMI team will pick them up and pass them to me. We'll do our very best to answer as many of them as possible over the next few minutes. So Mike, Catherine, you're both running organisations that are facing into the prospects of how you reopen uh, in the most unusual of circumstances following the, the COVID crisis. Both of you are playing different roles, in either in executive or non-executive uh, positions. But how would you sum up the challenges that you're facing at the moment? And what are the leadership skills that you're really needing to exercise right now? Cathy, perhaps we can start with your views on this, please. Yeah, well, it's been a very um, interesting time for, I think, many, many businesses across the UK. Um, you know, thinking back, it feels like quite a long time ago now, but uh, back in March... I remember the evening of March 23rd um, and, you know, we had literally a matter of hours to make decisions about an estate of over 244 huts, you know, kind of 6,000 6, people's jobs at that time. And, and you know, we had to consider what we were going to do um, following changing information coming through minute by minute, really. Um, and we, we shut most of our estate, uh, but we made the decision to stay open, which at the time was quite controversial, actually, um, for takeaway only in 40 of our huts. Um, and kind of the, the reason we decided to do that is we we thought it'd give the whole organisation, whether they were working or not, a focus. Um, and it would also keep a heartbeat through all of our supply chain. And we sort of signed up to help the NHS and to provide food for the NHS around our local areas. So it just kind of gave us a real drive to keep, keep things going, really. Um, but again, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges was really communicating with everybody, getting information out there. And trying to create, you know, create some clarity where really at the time there wasn't very much. Um, so in that phase, it was it was very much about in the moment decision making, um, not prevaricating over small points of detail, but get, getting to the heart of the big things that need to be decided. And then talking to people and listening to people, you know, and recognising what they were scared about and what we needed to do to sort of protect our employees. Um, but, you know, in, in some ways, very, very exciting times. Fantastic. Some, some interesting angles there in terms of the decisions to remain open and how you could support the, the key worker community particularly. Mike, what about from your perspective with the, the organisations that you chair? What were the challenges that, that you face and the role that you play? Well, I, I think um, Catherine's already sort of brought out one of the, the key points, which is that when you are chairman right, um, of a listed company, you know the board and the executives are a team, but during the crisis... Uh, the pressures on them sort of diverge, right? And Catherine was saying, I mean, it literally the, the leadership team are having to make decisions on the day at the moment very quickly um, and get on with it. Um, whilst the non-executives are standing back and thinking, is everything going okay? And, you know, what about some of the bigger strategic issues that we're going to face and so on? Um, and getting the balance where you don't, if you like, load up the executives with a lot of pressure from the board wanting to be engaged and yet not disengaging the board is, is a sense of sense of balance. So, for example, I think one of the things that we did really well at SSP was to move very quickly 
to refinance. I think we were the first FTSE 350 company to actually do a, a rights issue. Um, and that involved all the board. And that was one where we had to act very quickly and we were all together, right? Um, but in some of the other areas, reputational areas, for example, we're very reliant on the executive doing a good job. And we had Millie's cookies, <laughs> doing cookies for the NHS and stuff like that. So they were doing all those things, but also much sort of more difficult things like the furlough issues, uh, downsizing, which we've announced that we'll have to do in the UK because most, I think we only have about 5% of our outlets open in the UK. Um, uh, those areas are sort of reputation the board needs to monitor, but if the board sort of tries to manage in some way to do that monitoring, then the executive can't get on with all those literally in the moment decisions that Catherine was talking about. So this sort of combination of being engaged but not overloading the, the executives, I think is, as a chairman um, and as a group of individuals, we've, getting that balance right is really difficult. I think we've just about achieved it. But of course, we've been doing it without a. <laughs> we've not done a playbook on this, so we've had to invent the balance as we've gone along. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so, throughout this this period of time, clearly in both of your your organisations, you've managed huge changes. Um, how have you approached that change process? I guess it's almost an ongoing process of change. And what advice would you give to to our viewers? in terms of what they can learn from your experiences. And, and Mike, perhaps we could start with your thoughts on this one, please. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, there is, we've had to make changes because of the crisis. And some of those, I think, are going to ultimately lead to sort of positive outcomes and a better business and a better uh, performance to the customer um, because we'll keep them. But the difficult bit of it is that you are making decisions to change with incredible le levels of uncertainty, right? And um, I think uh, I think I mentioned earlier t when we chatted about this, Matt. Um, I uh, uh, in the boardroom I banned the use of the word forecasts, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we don't know what's going to happen. We can have scenarios, but we can't have forecasts. The other thing is that some people's tendency is. This is a crisis and we have to act decisively. So let's act now, right? And sometimes it's really wise to act now. I've talked about um, a rights issue um, at, at SSP. It was right to act now. But in some cases, you just have to, even though you don't want to, you have to hang back because we're going to have to find out where we end up because for sure the new normal won't be the old normal. And therefore, the longer we can delay some decisions, the better. And I think that combination is such a new world for many people, right, that they really struggle with the pressures that that puts on them, the uncertainty and the fact, I haven't done anything, should I have done something? Um, and, uh, you know, I think ultimately also pushes it at the boundaries of sort of mental health issues, right? So I think we've got to be really sensitive when we see people struggling with, that decision-making process in a, in a world of such unbelievably high levels of uncertainty. So, so if you're one of the people feeling it, go and get help and advice. And if you're one of the people where your team are feeling it, but you're coping, be very sensitive around helping them through it. And I think, you know, for those of us in the UK, uh, just in the last hour alone, we've heard yet more changes being implemented. And I, I guess we're in for a period of that for quite some time to come. Uh, but it, it really does make your point. And I, I guess in a way, redefines uh, a, a big piece of what traditionally has been felt is important from leaders in terms of that provision of certainty. Um, mm -hmm. a, a huge leadership challenge there. Yeah. Catherine, I, think, I, think being, I think being honest about the uncertainty as well, don't feel obliged to be certain, right, if you're not. Yeah, I t totally agree, Mike. I mean, that, that's that's exactly kind of where I was going to go it, down a similar line. I mean, the, th the thing we found that, you know, in normal corporate land, you'd make a decision at the board level or management level and it would filter and there'd be a number of phases of filtering before it would necessarily reach the, the lion's share of the organisation. And it'd all be, be very, you know, very thought through and, and possibly a little bit corporate sometimes. And in fact, you know, in the last few months, all of that's been washed away um, and... 
you know, probably like most organisations, we've been doing weekly all company webcasts where we talk about everything, you know, it's, it's questioning anything you want to question. And people do, you know, they go right to the nub of the difficult questions that you'd normally have lots of time to think about and sort of try and, you know, position. But there's no such thing that you just got to be really honest with people. And exactly that point, tell people what you know, what you don't know. And, you know, just if you can, um, reassure around what you can, but but not to the point of overly protecting people. And I think, you know, we talk often as managers about treating people like adults. And I think in the last few months, we've absolutely had to do that because, you know, the normal systems have not been in place to do anything other than. Um, but I think on the point of mental health, I, I totally agree again, Mike. I mean, even on our weekly webcast, we have um, oh, we've got a couple of coaches that have worked with our company for many, many years, actually. Um, you know, some wonderful psychologists. And they just give us little weekly snippets of, of things that can help us, you know, just ways of thinking that can can help to balance stress and can kind of just help people deal with with angst. Um, and I think, you know, again, one of the things that, that Jens, our CEO, says a lot, actually, which is very true, I think, which is you know, try not to get too attached to outcomes, you know, to try not to sort of focus too much on something that's going to happen in the future, just focus on what you're learning now. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's um, it's helpful not to, you know, wedge yourself to a particular outcome. It's incredibly insightful. Thank you. And so in, in the sectors that you're both operating in, they're highly competitive. Um, have you found ways in which you've been able to gain competitive advantage in any way through the way in which you've reacted to the, the challenges of these times? Mike, how, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, I, uh, I think we have got a couple of very important areas where, you know, we, we, have, we are creating co competitive advantage um, partly because of it. And, and then we're also learning how important some of our strengths can be um, in the competitive situation. To jump away from the um, food and beverage sector to my other role, which is coats, which is part of the global uh, supply chain for textiles. We make the threads for many of the garments around the world. Um, agility, right, and managing the supply chain when it's being massively disrupted has been a huge competitive advantage for us. We have um, we have struggled over time, for example, to get into the German automa automakers, right, around you know threads for seats and all that sort of stuff. Um, we were able to supply, right. So we gained long term contracts. We were able to supply not because every one of our factories was up, because many of our factories were down with lockdowns, but we were agile enough to be able to solve the problem. Um, and I think in the case of SSP, we have all these outlets at airports and railway stations. Um, I, I think I said earlier, normally they're just open, right? Um, uh, what, we have be, what we have been doing and realizing is that we can open selectively. So the ones that we open are profitable. Um, um, so if you've got 10, don't open all 10, you know, it's, it's not gonna work. Um, and then the other thing is we're going to, you know, um, learn that we are going to have to be opening and shutting. You know, the Spanish quarantine change, stuff that's just been announced today as we were talking about, that, that decision to say we're going to close back down again, we're going to open again, that sort of agility I think is very important. The other area for sure is how complexity uh, comes into non-value added complexity comes into businesses. Um, when when the tide is sort of high and everybody's growing, you can sort of live with the complexity that comes in. So that chef that decides they'll add a little twist to the menu, okay, fine. Um, or, you know, a client at one of the airports says, your range of Australian wines is not good enough. Please add this one and that one. Um, or the manager who says, I've, I've got a... You know, a third daily report that I'll find extremely helpful, right? Um, and because you've got the slack of growth, right, you can grow your margin still, grow your profits and accept it. You can't afford it in this environment. So I think the non value added complexity, you know, that doesn't add any value to the customer or the clients, um, which we've had to take out we should just leave out because it'll make us it'll help with agility and it'll it'll help with um our performance results but it won't affect the offering to the ultimate consumer um and uh, i think that there are two areas where i think through the lessons of this we'll get an edge that will keep 
Very good, very good. Great to, to hear your thoughts on that, Mike. And I know, Catherine, there's, there's a number of things within what Mike said that you can certainly relate to from the perspective of your organisation. Yeah, totally. I mean, we're, we're a very data-led organisation and, you know, we use the power of having a big estate to test lots of things. So we've always got multiple tests going on all over the place. And often, you know, we kind of kid ourselves that we can read them with any great sense of accuracy anyhow and that, you know, we sort of rely on, on these tests to, to make decisions. And, you know, the last few months we've gone from 80 menus, seven price bands, you know, umpteen million tests out there probably all crossing over each other um, and of course all of that's been wiped away um, we're now on one um, which is effectively a giant test that we're reading very very rapidly um, and adjusting off that giant test and actually I think we're making more progress doing it that way um, you know uh, the last few months we bought in things like uh, um, mobile ordering um, order and pay which was something we've been looking at for a couple of years actually um, and was way off. It was way off down our development plan, but suddenly it became a necessity because we're working on the basis of trying to minimise touch, um, you know, not knowing how quick we could run menu prints or that kind of thing. So it became mission critical. So suddenly on being mission critical from taking years, it took four weeks um, and, it's, and it's out there and it's working fine. Still a lot to do to make it better, but it's that sort of 80-20, isn't it? And not being held back by absolute perfectionism. So I think I think we've learned something about not not being too perfectionistic, but perfectionistic, but learning as you go, basically the kind of agile learning. Um, and uh, yeah, also I think in terms of decision making, we might Mike talked about this um, uh, very deeply a minute ago. But uh, you know, it, old, old world, which was a lifetime ago now, uh, we'd be sitting in huge meetings with representatives from every single functional department in order to make a, a very small decision about something. And it would take ages and it would go up and down the, the chain probably two or three times um, and then eventually get to the customer, goodness knows when, later. Um, and now, you know, again, the power of technology and teams, uh, you can have a very swift meeting that could be scheduled same day, um, cover off what you need to cover off, make the decision, make the change, make it happen, get it in front of the customer in a matter of days. Um, and I think, again, that speed to market through being able to make decisions much faster and cutting out the functional silos. I think, you know, we, we talked about it in theory, I think, for many, many years. You know? um, but actually, now we've been sort of forced to put it into practice. And I think now we have and we're comfortable with it. There's no going back. No. It's fantastic to hear the simplification of uh, leadership in many ways, I guess, that uh, yeah. hopefully we to the future. So one of the things that there's been a lot of discussion about, I guess, in, in recent weeks is the, the need for organisations to become more resilient. Um, and Mike, you touched on this a little bit with regard to Coates and the fact that you've been able to sort of develop new partnerships, new client bases because of the ability to supply where others couldn't. So I'm um, just interested to hear a little bit about your, your perspectives on the importance of resilience in the, the sectors that you're operating in. And perhaps, Kath, if you could take this one first, please. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, in, in, our, um, in our industry, um, obviously it's very difficult when you are a, um, a business that's focused on one given area. So, you know, we, we reliant on, on dining out, so people leaving their homes to dine out. So like many, many restaurants, you know, COVID has impacted us dramatically because if people aren't eating out, we, we can't provide our services. So I think at, at a business level, um, diversification, you know, for us, a lot of aggregators, um, takeaway, just different ways of getting your products to market. Very important that we able to maximise all of those as quickly as possible. Um, and then in terms of just personal resilience, I think, you know, again, it's a very emotional thing, isn't it? It's about dealing with, with all the things we've talked about, ambiguity, um, just, you know, having those strategies in place that you, you can cope when things get bad because we all experience it and we all have highs and lows and, you know, in-betweens. And, and I think it's that emotional resilience more than anything else that will enable companies to kind of get through. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be very much about building people's character. Indeed, indeed. Mike, any, any further thoughts to add from yourself on the point around resilience? Um, well, a couple of thoughts. I mean, one, that sort of helping leaders who are in the front line of this um, uh, ha have the resilience. Uh, you know, I think that the role of uh, boards, chairmen, you, 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 <laughs> in a way you're standing at the edge of the fire, you're not in the middle of it, you know, dealing with it. Um, being the sounding board that you know instills confidence is there when needed if you can be there when somebody can come and say i'm not 100 percent sure i've done the right thing what do you think right i think that's quite important so the, the people who are in a supportive role 
you know, need to up their game as well, um, recognizing the stresses that are and strains that are on the executive teams. The other thing that I, I mean, it's a little bit of an anecdote, um, is around business continuity thinking, right? Um, I know that many, many executives, you know, their eyes glaze over when somebody starts talking about, you know, when are we going to test the business continuity plans? That you know, think I've got many, many other things to do. It was, it was quite interesting that um, we had modelled in codes, right? What would happen if there was a, a significant disturbance in the South China Sea? And I guess most people on this call know that that's an, a remote possibility, but not an insane thing to talk about. And rather than just say, oh, that's interesting, I wonder what we do, we went through a full exercise of, okay, how would we deal with this? Just to see. And in many respects, some of the COVID effects have been the equivalent. So one of the reasons that we were able to do some of that agility in the supply chain is we gamed it seriously. Um, uh, and, you know, places like our Vietnam operation or whatever, and how we got supplies, all of that we, we gamed already, right? Um, so, and, and, and probably you think this is a typical chairman, you don't realize how much hard work we're doing, we can't do business continuity plans as well. Um, but the role of business continuity thinking and not treating it just as a sort of, uh, you know, trivial exercise, I, you know, I think we'll build resilience. And then I guess the final point I'd make is, and we've all, I think everybody in the hospitality sector has learned this, uh, debt leverage is great when everything's normal, um, but the levels of leverage uh, can be quite painful. Um, when you realize that actually you need to get people through the door every day. And if they're not coming through the door, you know, you, you lose your revenues and more great, you know, it's not great brilliance of strategic thinking, but both the companies as um, involved in, we have debt, but we, we weren't highly leveraged. And in a way that's made it a bit easier to cope with incredible, particularly in the case of SSP financial pressures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so just just thinking about um, the future for a moment. In recent weeks, with these these broadcasts, we've we've talked a lot actually about the need to avoid simply slipping back into the the old practices that we we had pre pre twenty twenty, I guess, and and resisting the urge to sort of reset everything back to to that stage. Thinking about the positives that have arisen during this time, and you, you've both touched on a number of them already. But what do you think are the the things that you believe the most important to preserve in terms of the things we've learned in this, this period of time. Mike, if you'd like to take that one first, please. Yeah, well, uh, Catherine's already touched on this, I think. Um, we're, change, we're changing the models of delegation, right? Um, you know, I, and I think retaining very thoughtful delegation so that decision making nearer the customer, right, nearer the front line um, can happen right? Because we've had to do it, right? And lo and behold, the world hasn't, you know, collapsed or whatever. So we can start doing, uh, you know, pushing that in. And yet, and this is why um, we'll have to be smart about it is, um, I think the ESG type pressures are not going to go away post COVID, they're going to get stronger, right? Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the area of social responsibility, but right across the board. And therefore, reputation and doing the right thing becomes very important. So you're worried that if I delegate everything away, will people do the right? So careful trusting of the organization, but trusting in a, in a smart way, I think, is something that we have had to learn. Um, and, and, we, you know, we really um, uh, must retain. And then the other one is, we've already talked about it, is don't allow that complexity just to drift back when the good times return. Um, I hope we have the discipline to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Catherine? Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've always worked quite a lot uh, remotely. So, you know, I, I have actually, generally speaking, quite enjoyed the technology. And, I, and I've enjoyed actually seeing all my teams day in, day out. Because, again, when you've got teams that are scattered all over the place, if you're living in a, in a world where actually you rely on face-to-face -face meetings in an office somewhere, you actually might only see them once every couple of weeks, maybe once a, once a month. But, you know, the power of this is you can speak to them, see into their lives, share things. It's actually in some ways more human 
Um, and, I, and, I, and I definitely think, you know, making sure that we don't sort of slip into just habits of, of wanting to meet in an office space to sit around a large table at a socially responsible distance with on the computer anyway, because some people are still a, a remotely, you know, we don't end up just doing silly things because we feel that's the what we should be doing. But actually, you know, continue to speak to people face to face all by it through technology, I think is, is a very, very positive thing. Um, and also, I think, you know, just generally speaking, it, 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 I think it's been great that it's forced everybody really to, to evaluate how they live and work. Again, you know, for years we've been talking about work-life balance and I think there's so many people that suddenly realise that an hour and 45 minutes commute through rush hour is complete dead time. You know, and actually you can be far more productive. I mean, look at the UK's productivity before this. It was very, very low. And kind of, you know, again, to my point, let's not, let's not go back to putting in valueless process and purposeless jobs. Let's make sure we build from it. We build, you know, jobs with purpose. Um, and, I, you know, Again, it, it's great that we're, we're putting value onto service more and care more because, you know, that's where there's going to be opportunities, I think. So so I think, again, you know, it's almost like everything, isn't it? Try and try and see the, the, the silver lining in things and, and build from what's what's positive and the innovation, the technology. There's been some major advances in a whole range of areas, which, you know, we want to continue that pace. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in a moment, we are going to go to the audience for some questions. And just a reminder, if you're watching live, please do... Uh, Pop your questions into the live chat. Um, but last question from, from me before we do so. When you reflect on the year so far, um, Kath, what are you most optimistic about for the future and, and what are you perhaps more, most concerned about? Um, I mean, I'm optimistic that some of the good things I've just mentioned will stick because I, I think people will demand that. And I think it's right as business leaders that we make sure that the future of employment does more to enable people to live a, a balanced life, you know, in a location they want to live, you know, enjoying the countryside, you know, being with their families and so forth, um, and still drive high levels of productivity. So, so I'm very optimistic that that will stick. Um, I, I'm sure there'll be lots of other good stuff too. And, and you know, with, with any change comes, you know, comes opportunity. So I, I'm quite excited really about what the next few years will, will do. Uh, Great. Thank you. Mike, what about yourself? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, as we've been talking, uh, uh, I think great teams, great businesses will come out of this stronger. You know, it's tough to cope with all this uncertainty. It, you know, it's tough to sort of um, be agile as, we, as we've talked. Um, um, but I think great teams will be able to do it better than others. So I, I'm, you know, very sort of parochially, I'm um, I'm sort of optimistic that we'll grow market share. How big the market is, don't know, but that we'll we'll grow both businesses will will grow market share. Um, I am also enjoying the fact that um, I don't have to sit in the taxi between meeting. I don't have an office, right? As a chairman, I just wander wander the streets of London, um, and the, I am doing probably more hours of work, but it's taken me less hours of time. Um, mm. For the reasons that Catherine was talking about. Now, I'm not as um, advanced as Catherine in thinking I'll have no face to face meetings, but I'm sure I'm going to have uh, a lot less. Um, and therefore, I do think work life balance would be better. Um, and that obviously applies to many people working in the areas that we work in. Absolutely. Okay, well, look, um, we, we've got a few questions from uh, from our audience, and uh, the first one's from Diane. Uh, great question, thank you, Diane. What is your top tip for making colleagues feel safe when returning to the workplace, particularly those that are performing roles where they come into face-to-face -face contact with the public? Yeah, like do you want me to, to, me to start? There's this very practical level to this. So I think um, having very clear processes in place. I mean, it was one of the things that we got to very early on in the lockdown process was to think about what would be the sequence of events of your guest coming into contact with your employees and what would you need to do to make sure that both groups were kept safe. So, you know, practically working through the process steps, making sure that the on-the-ground managers are trained so they know what to do, they know what to say, they know how to deal with circumstances where perhaps the customer's not actually following the process. You know, they feel empowered to deal with those instances. But, you know, on, on a very simple level, you know, we check in with our teams, we check their health in the mornings, 
Um, we have a, you know, obviously sanitizing protocols, you know, all sorts of guidance physically, you know, visual management in the space that people are working in. Um, and I think, you know, from what I've seen, actually lots of places have done that really, really well. Um, and more than anything, again, we've said it a few times in this, but just communicating. So talking to the teams, they know what to expect. They're not, you know, it's no surprises day one. That's probably the biggest. Mm -hmm. Mike, any thoughts? I mean, a lot of your people are dealing with people from across the globe coming into the sites that they're working on. How, how does that impact? Well, I mean, I think, to be honest, I think Catherine's covered most of it from the point of view of um, having the right processes, you know, touchless menus, contactless card payments, um, screens, uh, training on what to do. So, I mean, I think it's a change of a process that's so important to give confidence to the customer and, and to the employee that you have to really think through minute detail, I would say, Catherine. I mean, it, it's it's minute detail, isn't it? It's not just... It's Absolutely. Yeah, it's every single tiny process and interaction that needs to be considered. Yeah. The other thing that we have, and this is more relevant to courts around the world, um, of being very comfortable about letting people take their time if they need to, to come to the decision to come back to work. Because um, uh, certainly in some of, you know, we, we, we're hopefully, we've seen the worst of it here in the UK, but in other parts of the world, you know, we're in Brazil, we're in India, um, other parts of the world, um, it's, it's gone up and down in waves, but people are getting very, uh, un understandably anxious so um, in some cases saying you know come back to work it's fine um, because they want to um, and in other places if people are a bit reluctant you know not pushing it too much now obviously there's a sort of financial cost to that but I, th I think it's small compared to um, you know keeping the engagement and the uh, uh, pride if you like in the yeah. organisation um, let people take their time if they need it yeah, we, we, we tried to make it a bit fun. So, so again, we had a focus of um, doing the, the food for the NHS and we use lots of social media. We use Yammer internally. So it was lovely because everybody at home on furlough were cheerleading the huts that were still open and still providing food. And it was that kind of go for it sort of atmosphere that people started to say, when's our hut opening? You know, can I come back to work? So you started to almost generate a pull um, to come back to work. So I think, again, comms is a big role to play. Fantastic insight. Thank you. I'm very conscious of time, but if I may, I'm going to squeeze in one last question. This one's from Kelly. Uh, and Kelly wants to know, how do you keep reinventing and adjusting to keep everybody on board? What are the critical things from both a non-executive and an executive leadership perspective that, that are essential to making that happen? Mike, do you want to offer a few thoughts? Well, well I mean, I, I, again, Catherine's preempted us in a way. Um, the most important thing is communicating right um and communicating quickly and thoroughly um you know uh, as Catherine talked about you know going up and down the chain and taking you know three weeks to finally get the message perfected before you go out is not going to work um and because the adjustments are going to be quite rapid compared to what people have been used to i think that need for constant communication is probably um you know by far the, the most important thing I think the other thing which people are really reluctant to do, but is to admit that you're not certain. Uh, most of my business career, the idea of going out to a large part of the organization as a leader and say, I'm not really sure, right, um, was like not acceptable, right? You know, you're showing weakness or something. Um, I think. Uh, being honest that you're making the best call at the time, but you're not 100% certain, um, rather than try and, if you like, um, disguise or camouflage the uncertainty and, and the ambiguity, um, I think that's going to be really important. There's obviously a balancing act because if everybody thinks you don't know what on earth you're doing and you have no confidence, then that's a problem as well. Um, but I think a little bit more openness about, mm -hmm. I'm not, sure um i think we'll go a long way and to kelly's point will mean that when you come back with a change it won't seem like that dreaded word from the journalist to u-turn yeah. and i think tolerance 
you know, again, when you're moving fast, sometimes mistakes happen. And I think just saying sorry, you know, got it wrong, uh, and just having a bit of shared tolerance for each other makes a massive amount of difference. Right. Yeah, I agree. Fabulous. Thank you so much to both of you for today. I think you've shared some incredibly powerful insights um, about both your thinking around what's been going on in recent times, but also, more importantly, the experiences that you've you've uh, you've had firsthand during this time. Uh, I mean, it really strikes me that throughout the conversation, we've covered a huge amount of ground, but that that confidence in human leadership, that level of trust, you know, whether you're in your position, Mike, uh, as a chair, and having that trust in the the executive, or whether it's uh, as leaders throughout organisations, le leveling that level of trust upwards, I think is is hugely important. In one of your messages, and something that really struck home for me was the need to reduce complexity, the non-value adding complexity. I think that's a great insight from from today's session. So thank you so much, both of you, for joining us and, and giving your time today. Thank you. And um, we'll be back uh, next week uh, for the next Better Managers Briefing, 1.15 next Friday. Look forward to seeing you there. Bye-bye.